Um, beneath us. and simplistic and unsubtle. Yes. And this may be the case with some sides, uh, but with those and upper pole, we are a little different. We can't prove that now, but if you'd like it, we can come and prove it to you personally at your day of dance. So I just, it's a little advert now. Um, we, we, um, we didn't know quite what to teach you. Uh, some of the clever, interesting dances. Um, and then we said no. Um, this is apparently supposed to be the equivalent of a chill out lounge now. So we're going to have it, this is, this is winding you down to, um, uh, to your tea. So we're going to do a couple of the more um, <laughs> simplistic dances. <laughs> is change the mindset now. We've got to go away from Cotswold. We've got to stop thinking. Uh, yeah, stop thinking. Yeah, you're not shooting the gun. Okay. Um, the first thing you've got to think of is that on your feet you now have black, shiny, very heavy army cadet boots. When they hit the floor they go thump. So gone is this nice up in the air, hanging about. Yeah, we're in the opposite direction now. We're thinking down. We're thinking big sticks. We're thinking black tap. We're thinking scaring the audience. <laughs> Actually, that's not very difficult. For you guys. <laughs> See that? Um, the other thing we need, we need a band. So we've, we've actually organised different musicians to play. Um, some bog standard tunes, uh, soldiers join and such like. If there is anybody else who doesn't fancy dancing but wants to come up and join, join in the band, please do. Percussion, tambourines, there's a spare melodeon down here somewhere. Right. I will attempt to teach these dances vox humana. As in, by reading a bit of paper. When it gets too complicated, I will come amongst you and use a, a demonstration set to, to show whatever. But we'll, Yes, <laughs> just push them about a bit. Yes. The, um, the first dance we're going to try, uh, uh, most of the elephant dances are um, written for special occasions. Um, and before we joined them in 93, there was a trip to Guernsey, which apparently was interesting. So we thought, <laughs> That's what I heard, yeah. Yes. Um, Journey over was interesting. There were, there's a couple of figures <laughs> that only exist in the, the, the name only now. We don't know how they went originally. And one of them was called Projectile Vomiting. <laughs> I suspect it was a rough crossing. And the other one was the interestingly named Dave Dex a Racist in the Toilet. <laughs> so, I, I only wish I'd been with them. That's how <laughs> right. Did they just get invited for once? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, they All we're going to be doing is single step throughout the entire dance. So you don't need to worry too much about the single step. Apart from the fact you need a stick. Big or small? Right. Um, ideally, you need it on the short side of long.
still time to go. Woo! Yes, exactly. So, shall we try that one? We will do that figure and the chorus.
uh, in the fours. Forget that there's somebody else standing next to you. Martin, define a step. Is that a step? Yes. Or is, so when you say two, it gets two is One, right, left. Two, you're there. Five. Now wait a minute. One, two, three, four. Four, 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 four steps. Four. I'm lying to you. We won't tell you because it counts, yeah. As I say, only Alan is perfect. You should put a deliberate mistake into everything you do. That was my one. It is four steps to get to your next position. The first corners, you cross right shoulders, you turn very, very sharply to your right, which means you're into the next position around the square. Meanwhile, the second corners have gone straight across. When you come to do it the second time, if you went straight across before, you then do the twiddly bit. If you did the twiddly bit before, you go straight across. Face. You do it the third time, you do it the fourth time. I'm standing here and I'm seeing people all over the place. Have you all got it? Yeah, brilliant. You will, yeah. By the time we go. Yeah. I'll tell you what, let, let's prove it, let's dance it. This is called bombast, or brackets, Peter Pont.
not get stuck at the bottom as you end up in middle in the floor. Do not attempt to get back to place. Do not try to get home. We will do showground.
Um, this is a dance from 93. It was written. Um,
People at the tops don't do anything. People in the middle do a left across. Just across, not back again. You have two steps. A le no, a left across. Like a country dance, hands across. You give left hand to your partner and change places with them. This is only the four people in the middle. You've crossed to their place. You look up and down the set and you pass the person along the side by right shoulder. It's a square. <laughs> you then offer your left hand to your partner again. You then pass up and down the set by right shoulder.
towards one another. And I will count. <laughs> okay. And it.
like to start with, you just dial this up the outside to the top of the set. So it gets you out of the way. Meanwhile, you two face down, you two face them. You're now going to move as a four up the middle of the set. So that means you've got to dance backwards. So you go that way. However, so you've chosen. However, so this being a boarding dance, you're not hitting sticks at the moment. So you actually have to hit sticks as you're going backwards. And we will, it actually fits.
pode ficar as fotos que é Turning in this general direction. We will also be going around. 
wage, you stop in a diagonal. So there will be two dancers back to back, and two dancers holding on to them. What will they do? So we will need a set that we will walk through the lefty people again. That one. Oh, good one. Now, don't bother about hitting the ground for that. We'll work on it. Approach your partner with your stick upright and grasp it. Now, you four and you four are working together. There's two ways of turning. There's a long way and a short way. The first thing we're going to do is go across the diagonal there. You have to go the long way round. So you go all the way round until you're in this position. You do the short one, you just go straight in backwards. So you're now going. <coughs> if you did a long one first, you do a short one second. So we're now going on to the next diagonal, which is this one. So you will now spin it. And we're up, go the right way round. There. You will now do a short one, you will now do a long one. Forming this diagonal, back to back, yes. And then we'll do one more for the next diagonal. <coughs> one more into low end, into a straight line, back to back. And then you've got enough music to go sideways to the other place. Now, as you are doubtless aware, the ideal secret of uh, speed, pull in. So as you turn, you pull in. As you get to place, you let out. So it spins you quickly, falls you into a line. It spins you quickly, falls you into a line. In theory. Would you like to see them do it again?
other chap's uh, wielding. Um, it could be the other chap has a sword. Not a problem, because if you freak them out an oak stick, um, it helps a lot because one slash on the stick and the sword sticks in the wood, <laughs> which gives you a slight advantage for, for a while. Uh, and so on. So um, there's a lot of it. Experience is the winning, is the way to win. As long as you've got something for it in your hand, chances are if you know how to use it and the other chap's not so sure, you can beat him whatever he actually has. An interesting sort of background is, so I, I was left saying, all right, all right What's the Morris? The Morris, when I looked up the, the, um, my Morris records, the average Morris stick is between 22 and 24 inches long. You will have to believe this, those of you who actually think that's 24 inches long. <laughs> All the men. <laughs> societies all had a, a stick or stave. Uh, the one over at um, South Park in Petersfield, uh, they most of them provide their own stick, which they then carved into the bark. I don't suppose you've ever, any of you have ever gone on the pen night day cutting IW day in the bark, in the stick and that sort of thing, but they used to, right? Yeah. yeah. So sticks were quite common. Um, we'll say quite common. In 1980, when the Salvation Army arrived at Basingstoke uh, to try and insist on a bit more teetotal, the um, local brewers uh, got together with a large gang, something like a thousand men, to deal with 20 lasses, I might say, yeah. all armed with sticks. And there was a riot in the town, which not only beat up the poor girls, but they beat up the town as well. But the important was, it was natural for everyone to actually have a stick. So that was the next bit, the sticks, you know. What does people's experience of people fighting with a stick? Now I've heard of single stick fighting at this stage. Um, and I then so I asked the martial arts again, I said, well, what's all that? Here? Well, well, if the sword's got two edges, it's a broad sword. And if it's got one edge, it's a back sword. And as it's made of metal, well, you practice with a wooden one, which is a single stick. So you start by start off with saying, all right, war office, you know, the sabre drill. You know, everything watched far from the magic crowd, 
Forrester D. Morris always had a sword man or two, with one or two swords in front of the twirl. The lady said, like, well, I want to make this show. These are all just twirling practices and so on. Um, so then she began to realize, hey, well, who, who had these implements in the first place? Looked up the police history. In 1820, when the Metropolitan Police was born, the river was issued with a trenchant and a two foot long sword. A cut the sea, used to call it. Now, we all would have visions of pirates and cutlasses, <laughs> you know. Um, and if you actually have an image you now of the police charging down the street waving cutlasses, they actually have <laughs> provocations. Yeah, um, that's one way to deal with rights. But not only have a trunchet, you see. So the next question is, um, how do you know explain to them how to use it? You know, because it's all very well being um, having a sword or a stick or some sort of other, but what do you do with it? They see the modern police have a trampoline, same sort of length. Um, now unfortunately, they're only there to defend themselves with it. Having said that, you know, there are camps and papers of uh, beating up people, uh, but that's not the normal way to do it. Um, yeah, uh, then there's instruction. The, the, when the police forces are formed, usually have an army officer as the chief constable or head constable or whatever it was called in each area, uh, who had an NCO that taught people what to do. And it does seem the fact they were given a drill, how to do on your own. Um, this century, the drill, they spent several days learning techniques, giving exercises to practice every day, and then they were checked every six months or a year to see if they know it get the refresher course and so on. Now, in the 19th century, where policemen were actually on foot in all the villages for the little uh, office and things like this, it would have been a common experience for people to see people twirling or whatever they did, you know, that's practicing with these things, they all pulled that. A single stick was not an uncommon thing. Again, looking at um, uh, programs for fates, when I say fates, I don't actually mean Jewish fates, <laughs> but fairs and things of that sort. The single stick, like quarter staff early on, was actually quite common. It was quite a common competition to have people there. Despite the fact that to win the single stick, the blood had to run one each from the head. You know, and it, um, it strikes me solid. I can see why the Victorians gave it up. <laughs> it's a, but um, Theodore Roosevelt, who was one of the American <coughs> presidents, if you, nobody's alive here now who remember that, but the turn of the century, he used to practice single stick every morning with one of his generals. You know, so it wasn't that long. And it was also an Olympic sport. Um, in, I can't remember if it was 1904 or 1908, whichever one, the meet, meeting was at St. Louis, so I think it was 1904. It actually, the Americans were the last, are the holders of the Olympic medal for single stick fighting. In fact, in this country, single stick has a, um, a competition as distinct from the demonstration, which was surprisingly common into the 1920s. So it's a way of doing things which people would have been aware of, which we've completely lost. I think we've completely lost it. Yeah. Now, what it does mean is that uh, things like, I mean, we all start with doubts like that, you know, and hold it like that, or perhaps like that. But the common starting point, the hanging guard, was actually in front. You're trying to protect your head, basically, from the other side. So it could be that people in the 19th century, um, appreciation of what you do with a stick and so on, is maybe somewhat different from what we do. Not that I'm saying we should change it, it's just to appreciate how what there are areas of our knowledge which have not actually come to us, is it by the collectors? Because the collectors themselves made assumptions about things, they didn't write them down, they on the road. Now, the, the other thing uh, about these short sticks is that in the um, border counties, Hereford, Shropshire, that side of the world, they tended to have not what we would call a trend. Tip star, which is a 
which is a shorter stick with something on the end. Um, these are sort of example, the, the short one, it has, these are policemen's trunks with a crown on the end. Maybe appropriate, right? But, um, the same thing, too. in the days before people could read and write and so on, they didn't have foreign <coughs> cards, they had a, a thing which actually had a, an indication that there was an official uh, painted on the, the badge for whatever the organisation they were, post office, railway, or whatever, and so on. Then their name, probably, certainly a number from where this was drawn from the um, armory or whatever, and so on. Now, the old Morris painted their sticks, and so on. <coughs> now, the thing about something which is nine inches to twelve inches long, there's no question of actually hitting like, you know, a smashing right with a hammer. It's all in terms of poking. You use the end for something or other. And of course, when it comes to the board of Morris, you know what I'm talking about? The board of Morris, we actually never saw, nobody's ever seen you know, a board of Morris side dance, as it were. We actually don't know what the performances were like. We do have some notations and things like this, but how they actually did things. So again, I want to throw a nice bit of doubt in your mind with actually the way it was done. Now, that brings me really to the second thing, the other bit, which makes reading most interesting. Uh, it all, I suppose it started when about 1959, 60, I ran a dance in free, you know, a local memorial. The loudly neighbour was uh, delivered, as it were, in a, in a um, wheelchair, to come and see the bar dance that we were running, parish bar dance. And she brought it on for interest in a photograph of her father rowing in a college in Cambridge along the Cessar Shop. She thought we might be interested. Well, quite interested, you see, because it was Cessar Sharp. But what it realised more recently that the problem was that well, Sharp grew up, as it were, at a time when sport in this country, in athletics and men's sport, particularly rowing, um, was growing out as an amateur sport, meaning it was aimed at the middle classes, you know, doing their best to avoid mechanics, artificers, um, engineers, and working people. But they barred in Henley somebody from rowing because he was a butcher. So I don't know if anybody were into dibbing for things of that sort. Didn't last for very long, but there was a whole period. Amateur. And of course, we've got the word amateurish, you know, as a way of performing, and the idea that um, something, it was the doing of it that was important, not the standard you achieved. You know, you did it for the fun and so on. Um, now, I'm quite sure all Morris dancers have heard this said. Um, I would say it's an excuse for poor Morris, because it all depends on what you think Morris is about. But Sharp, um, Though he could communicate quite well with his informants, was not the sort of person in terms of a culture that worked with the working classes. Those people I've interviewed in the 60s and early 70s who belonged to EFSS classes in Cotswold uh, had wonderful times with wonderful time there, but they saw themselves with a class difference. Uh, class differences, as far as I am personally concerned, have not existed really in my lifetime. There are class attitudes around, but not in the way they were in the between wars. And certainly, thinking back to talking <coughs> again to the Chaplain Morris, for example, with their contacts with the tradition, everyone was a professional in a profession of some sort or another. There was sort of a basic goal. And one when I think of the revival, I've got to say, really, between the wars, um, it was a, uh, a survival. Where people kept the thing, Morris ticking over. And basically, if it hadn't been for the women doing the Morris and so on, it probably would have survived whatsoever. <coughs> uh, just say that. Uh, there has been an enormous difference in my lifetime. Those of us of my age who benefited from the 1944 education act, I've said this before, you know, free grammar school education and on to university and so on. Um, we've had in the 70s at least a whole 
generation of um, people coming into the Morris who were educated and understanding it but a working class background and had an appreciation of what the Morris was for, even though they may not have known it explicitly. You know, they had this sort of background. And one has to try and understand the revival, what we call the revival, in these terms. That in fact, um, there were a lot of do-gooders, as far as I was concerned. You know, wonderful people, you know, the tune of Sharp, the and so on, was wonderful. But they failed to give back the, um, the tradition, as it were, to the people. There are a number of people today, uh, which you probably think of either, who actually distinguish between the traditional sides and us. You know, they see there as two different beasts, as it were. Um, my lifetime was spent really on trying to get people to dance because there's something great about the Morris in general. Right? Which brings me back to where I started, <laughs> which is martial arts. But one interesting thing about martial arts is how they, the, before, the ones who concentrate their life on it, to the world, have a feeling about movement, rhythmic movement, and doing things and so on, which leads them to philosophize about it, and so on. Um, and they can get great thoughts, but maybe silly ones, in the sense that, you know, uh, it really doesn't depend on a bit of uh, rigor or about some goal or other. Uh, um, but they are capturing some sort of magic. Now, some of you may remember a few years ago that long distance runners started saying, you know, when they run after a while, somehow or other they got detached from things. They got a fun bit, which is Wonderful until they started to think about it, then suddenly disappeared. You know? um, people who do um, meditation achieve these sort of states and so on. Now, I think at the moment we, we try to sell the Morris to people um, in terms of it's fun. You know, it's fun to do, good exercise. Uh, it's very sociable you know, in the sense that it's small groups, you get to know everybody. It's a wonderful feeling and so on. Um, but we tend, being modest and English, is, uh, to denigrate it all a bit. You know, we may get a bit of a laugh, you know, and say, oh yeah, it's a good fact, you know, like they don't take it seriously. And yet, nearly everybody here has been here before. You know, and I was, we're, we're talking about people who actually commit their life to the most one way or the other. You know? Like I can remember some of you as small girls at university. <laughs> <laughs> and so on, you know, um, it's something good. And we don't actually use that, to my mind, in selling the Morris to people. That is something we get out of it, and so on. And perhaps our problem is that we don't actually have somebody who sits and says, well, there's more to it. You know, it's an alternative medicine. Oh, I don't know, I'm not so afraid of it. But there's something about the Morris, the magic of the Morris. It isn't magical in the sense it makes the, the corn to grow. You know, well, it, it hasn't done in my lifetime. Really. <laughs> you know, but it does make people grow. Um, it's when I meet friends in more sites I work with who just sit there and say, I wish I played the Morris years ago. Uh, it's become so much part of my attitude toward life. So, I really love it. so really I want to say that summarize what I've said today is that some of the things which we take as perceived perceived wisdom may not be true. Right? No, we still do that. Not that it actually matters, you know, unless you're one of those who believe that the things you were told when you were young must be true. You know, that some of these things are conditioned by the attitudes of the past. I mean we had this terrible problem of recent years of so-called Victorian values. And so you examine Victorian values and say, my God, I don't really want those in the way uh, they were in terms of hypocrites and attitudes to other people and other races and things like that. Yeah, we don't actually want that. So we're trying to get rid of that sort of thing. You know? But also, there's something more to the Morris, I think, than what um, we tend to make in our public image. And I personally believe we should be trying to make more of it. I say that maybe because in my age and my degree of infirmity and so on, you know, it's your problem, not mine. <laughs>
questions or just let them get on with them? What do they like to do? Yeah. They're all looking at me actually as they say, what the rubbish are you talking about? <laughs> seen a picture, I've just acquired in a book about Hampshire Police, which shows the, our local police who ceremonially protect the judges at this side of Winchester. And there's a, a set of 14 of them, well actually 15, but there's one of them up there, all with six foot staves, you know, with a spear head on them. Um, there's no premises somewhere up there, but there's a picture of them actually with the judge in the middle protecting them. They still have a set, and they still do it every year. In other words, the stain is a symbol, well, of office, authority, you name it. You know, sure, it's nothing to do with phallic systems, it's to do with being boss, is it the word. Um, and as I said, uh, almost anybody who had any sort of job ended up with some symbol. Certainly in the days, but before most people were little. In um, the history of horse dancing by John Forrest, anybody read it? Yes. yes. Yep. Well, I'm sure you must remember that um, he suggests that the Morris originally came as a as a people who went and collected the watch and actually led the watch together to to parade. So effectively, the Morris were the people who actually led the watch. So they were. That's one of the origins of Morris dancing. Thank you. 
Well, the, uh, John Forrest and Mattachan argued for the Mattachan theory, didn't they? The early uh, Morris Annals only has one reference in 800 that mentions sticks. Yeah. They're part to go with the word Morris. To go with the word Mattachan, yes. Yeah. Because a lot of the kind of central, what, 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 what I think of central Cotswold yeah. Morris, which has the sort of either galley or hook leg and all the range of slopes. They, they, they seem to be essentially thank you. Yeah. 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 These Whereas weekends are living examples of how the Morris is able to acquire everything. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, it doesn't matter where it comes from, the idea is it. We've had sort of a southern German and Basque today, and if, well, I was watching anyhow, uh, but over the years, you know, um, yeah, it acquires things. Now, I imagine that the Morris actually got involved in the world that sort of way because of its ability to adapt and to acquire elements for everything else. It fitted the occasion rather than you have to take it the way it is, as it were. And they're all doing that. All sort of, you know, you went up to a, a set of dancers, you can put, put a show together, things like this, you have to be incredibly flexible. And that's what appeals to the Morris and Barber see in Denmark and Holland, and elsewhere in the Red World. Yeah, um, so it, it, it suits. Certainly what you were saying, there's a distinct difference between the stick dances and the and handkerchief dances. They have a totally different feel, although they're both dances, you know, it's a very high proportion of stick dances in the tradition. Yeah. But definitely you have a different feel from the stick dances and the handkerchief dances. Well, when I noticed um, in measuring you know, watching sight and measuring it, is that stick dancers are always, Cotswold stick dancers are always dancing faster than handkerchief dancers. You know, the difference of speed is not trivial. Because you don't have to be so expressive in a stick dancer to get the stick to do it for you. And I thought that's really why the border Morris is so popular, because it put all the emphasis on the pattern and the stick, you know, rather than on the steps and all the more difficult things. But there's no doubt that the Board of Morris, despite its re recent origin, <coughs> uh, we tell the tale that uh, we know when Board of Morris and this country started because we were expecting our son Reuben that day. And he left me. Two days later, he did the point gave birth to. He's a beauty. No, Tubby was late picking me up for workshop with that one o'clock or three o'clock workshop and we pulled into the table board that we as the duck struck three <laughs> with this explanation, you know, about why we were um, a bit cutting it a bit fine and everybody apparently spent the rest of the day waiting for a telephone call to tell us what boy what, what baby was. We <laughs> took his time. Which was already well we got through to the end of that. We said they had to drive back in this thunderstorm. As we were driving up the motorway, the old wife was started doing this, <laughs> <laughs> crossed and stuck. <laughs> so there we were on the motorway with no windscreen wipers and this heavy rain. So we had to open the side windows and I looked at it one minute. <laughs> <laughs> we drove along a little bit more carefully. Yeah. So we got, got to Fleet and discovered she was in the hospital but hadn't had the baby. So he took me in the next day to see Marguerite and so on. And then he came, uh, having spoken to Marguerite, we then came back and as we passed the paratroop museum, he said, oh, paratroop museum, I was in the paratroop museum. So he pulled in the stock and went into this place, which I might say was a Sunday as well. And he bent up to the sergeant in charge and said, um, this is the paratroop museum, and I see it's, it's free if you're an ex-paratrooper. So I can't prove I was a paratrooper, um, I was a paratrooper, but I can still do a forward roll. <laughs> and the sergeant said, that's not good enough. He said, well, the reason I can come, come here is that I was told it's the only museum in the country that's got a bar. He said, if you believe that, you must have been a paratrooper. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, we invited Bath City and Windsor to a uh, oh, Saturday at our house, um, partly because Windsor complained that they didn't get enough food on the normal Mark store, so we thought we'd fix that. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we took, took the Bath City to the 
this parachute museum, thinking, how do you tell me how it won't read there, that they will all be interested to see it. See? So he marched up to this uh, <coughs> big model of the dropping zone in Sicily, where he'd been a, a glider made who had dropped into the sea. Um, and because they were dropped in the sea, it had the swim to the shore. The second um, airborne division, who were at that time at Plymouth, were taking the full kit to load the swimming pool, and all pushed into the pool so they could swim with their kit on. Which is how uh, Morris Sutherland learned to swim. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But still, they got in there, we stood around this, around this display, and he started, we were going to explain about it, and he said, I was dropped in so and so. The team just said, why? <laughs> <laughs> Rather than sympathetic. <laughs> That's how I know the one of our examples of the weekend. It's been printed on my memory. He was born on the Monday for those of you that know. <laughs> for all these sort, you know, that fills a certain sort of need that wasn't being met by anybody else. And it wasn't being met by um, women's sides doing Cotswold Morris at that particular time. You know, um, the same way um, in the room, right at the Federation of one world, um, we introduced <coughs> into a lot of the Northwest, the Cheshire type dances and so on, which had only been done by school children before, and so on. And that fits in it sufficiently well to encourage the men in the Northwest to actually dance as well. So we've got a thriving tradition again <coughs> of since the war. Oh, it's good, really. Is it one of the things that, that, that we, we, we tend to be in with looking about performance? Uh, is it that, that uh, when I ask it, at a certain time, so the opportunity for performance, people want that, that opportunity, and they seek the niche in the market. I mean, we're all, all here very certainly with the rise of uh, American Appalachian yeah. Yeah, in, in this country. For, and it has no other groups except it's fun to do. It's something different from other groups in doing so differentiated. 
sustain itself. So these things pass through. Yeah. But to some extent, Coswell, Morris as a term, well, allows you to carry on, and it, that strange just carries on into the future. Well, it's extent. strange the way things go. Um, when Tubb and I went to the States, I was both thinking of States 79, in Philadelphia, we were, went to dance, we came to dance, where we were introduced to some American clogging teams. You know, eight women, rather pretty dresses, you know, doing 19 to the dozen Appalachian, well, square dancing, you know, basically, and things like this. So absolutely incredible. And such, and we both said, well, why are we actually teaching people Cotswold Morris when they've got a wonderful tradition of their own? Didn't understand it, of course, we did. <laughs> we didn't understand the roots of the depression and uh, the pro professional, semi professional troops that had gone on in the States and so on. You know, um, and it requires a bit. Funny enough, Appalachian clubbing in this country has gone quite a different route. When I was at Pine Woods, you know, we went around talking to all these people who could clog and do some filming with different styles and so on. And there are an awful lot of very regional styles. Uh, Jim Morrison was actually doing um, what I would call Virginia style, all based on Charleston steps and so on. You know? um, so Mrs. Carter was doing something that looked almost like North Northern clubbing, you know, another really very step movement of the feet at all. It's all very close to the So enormous variety. None of which is got across this side of the country. <coughs> we also have not picked up the sort of choreograph movement, which seemed to be common over there. And certainly I don't see the sort of thing that I saw at Berea, you know, where they do the big circle dances and everybody was clocking away like that. Um, it's quite a different tradition in this country. But it's grown out, really, of a need to make people saw it. Um, There's a difference between English club and American club. One goes up and one goes down. That's basically all you can say about it. One's up in the air when you're doing the basic movement, the other one's down on the way when you're doing the basic movement. And you're either one or the other. <laughs> sort of thing. No, I think I totally said that. <laughs> Who could do both? <laughs> That's called flapping. Yeah. 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 So, in a sense, these things appear not quite out of the blue, but um, almost by accident. <laughs> you know, and they find a sort of niche. And if there's early on in the style, there's a good example of it, like the Shropshire Bedrooms and Seven Champions, you know, they set the style for everybody. And that's what people want to really do, the impact that these people had. And I see with Cotswold as well. There are some good Cotswold time there. Always happy, they have an impact, and people want to do cops and rocks. Except when you come to a competition with noisy bottle clocks, always win. <laughs> <laughs> because the uneducated judges, and I say uneducated, <laughs> you know, are somewhat impressed by it. Yeah. Well, I mean, only it, it, it was an advanced festival where we had a folk dance competition. You know, and the Bampton side came forth. You know, I thought well, that was really a bit unfair for somebody who actually danced better than anybody. And the club tied, uh, still walked away with it. All the other three judges thought they were wonderful. What they did to the polished floor, this <laughs> <laughs> You've seen Orion Sword's newest dance with some Appalachian clogging in it? The American yeah, long sword team that came over. This is Bernstein. The, uh, Bernstein. Ira Bernstein. Ira Bernstein. 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 Bernst
Morris dancing and everything English. And now we have the Americanization of that, and we have an American team taking a long sword dance and putting out blades of clock in it. And they just came over to England and apparently oh, were a big hit over here. And they will be at Sydney this year. Yeah. Is that cross culturalization or globalization? <laughs> You still be a for it. No matter what the theme is in the Christmas Rebels, you always get the Abbas Bromley horn dance. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. Well, we'll move your chairs back to the on the next session. <coughs> Thank you very much, Roy. Wonderful. Yeah.
much better after half a bottle of vodka. <laughs> so, just looking at where's Adrian, she knows it.
entirely different tune. We'll see how you get on. And afterwards, I'd like to know what you think about it, please. I like feedback.
phase, but the second phase is more rigid. Um, so, yeah, a different tune, not necessarily better, but um, definitely different. There's, there's <laughs> well, no shortages in Morris. Yeah. I don't expect to come to any firmer conclusions about this evening, by the way. This is really to make you think rather than to tell you any, uh, any answers. Should we talk about the next tune? Yeah. What was the other one? Oh, yeah. yeah. We're going to do the same again, just a different tune again. So same step, same dance. Different tune. See what you think this time. So a set to my book one is
Wait, so they wouldn't do Boris dancing there. <laughs>